Ladies and gentlemen, I am really excited to have Gustavo Imov with me. Hi, Gustavo. Hey, Gregorio. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you very much, Gustavo, for, for being in. It's really a big pleasure to have you on, on my podcast. You are one of the co-authors of Customer Experience 3, the book that, the book that we brought together. And you helped me also during the journey of creating my chapter. You provide really great feedback on my chip, uh, chapter. And also in this case, and publicly, thank you very much for your, for your support. But now I'm not speaking about myself anymore. Could you please introduce yourself with a short introduction, Gustavo? Absolutely. Thank you for having me, uh, Gregorio. So I'm Gustavo Imhoff. I've been in customer experience for essentially my entire career. And I, I like to joke to say I'm one of that new breed of customer experience professional. I started it, I started in CX when it was already as we understand it today, you know, running voice of the customer program, driving transformation across the organization. And my, my bread and butter, my background was uh, VOC, so I used to run agency side uh, inside programs for large organizations across the UK and um, across Europe as well. And then I moved in in terms of uh, leadership roles in client sides, and I've been stuck in ever since, enjoying helping businesses from the inside on how to transform themselves. And as you said, had the crazy idea of joining that customer experience three book project and been enjoying the ride ever since. Thank you very much, Gustavo. And perhaps you forgot to mention or you didn't mention that you are a rising star in customer experience. You are extremely young and already one star in customer experience and you are extremely active also on LinkedIn. We are following you and you are really providing pills, really great nuggets on, 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 on customer experience. And thank, thank you for, for that. And what I would like also to mention is we have two Swiss citizens on this on this call, I, I would say hello, grüezi, <laughs> Gustavo. But we will continue in, in 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 English for sure, no problem at all. Yeah, thank God. I, I, as I told you earlier, my my, my Schweizer Dutch is very rusty. So the, that's how it is in Switzerland, right? Is if you have the the Swiss roman, the French speaking, and the and the Schweizer Dutch together, we just default to English. So let's do that. No, that's, that's clear. And I think it's a language that everybody can understand. And um, I think I would really like to deep dive in your chapter of customer experience three. You are on the st strategic, strategic side of, of the discussion. And I really, really enjoyed uh, trying to understand and going through your description. It's really a very well written chapter then that helps really people to understand and to think about customer experience, perhaps from an other point of view with an other flavor. With an other flavor. And therefore to, start, to kick off the discussion, I, I'm trying also to follow a bit the structure in, in, um, in your chapter. Um, normally we say you interact with the company and then based on the interaction that you have with the company, you can predict uh, if they are coming back and buy again. What's your view on that? Or how are you seeing this, this topic? Um, that, that's the thing, right? Is the, the title of the, of the chapter is Experiences Don't Matter, Memories Do. And that's, that's a small but important distinction that, that I make because all people that focus on analytics and predicting on the back, on the back of interactions, they're making the assumption that the experience that we have, the actual interaction drives future behavior. They're making the assumption that we have that connection when actually it's not true, right? Is what drives how we act, how we behave is what we remember of the interactions. If what we remember and what happened are exactly the same thing, that's fine. Let's use all those fancy analytics and we'll have a pretty robust model. Problem is they're not. There's a disconnect in between what happens and what we remember of them. And that's why I always kind of say, look, what matters is how customers feel, what they perceive and what they remember of the experience, because that's what drives their future behavior. And if you think about customer experience as a, as a discipline, as, as a field, our goal is to improve business uh, performance. How do we improve business performance? By impacting customer behavior in the future. And that, that, that's why I make that distinction. Let's focus on what they remember more than what happens. And perhaps, Gustavo, what, what, what do you remember about your um, journey 
because I think it's really a journey what you are describing also in, in the chapter about your experience with, with, the, with the restaurant. Well, th th that's the thing, right? I, I use that example of going to a cabaret restaurant in London to kind of illustrate that. And what I say is it was a really, really surprising experience, very immersive. So if you think of Joe Pine experience or uh, the experience economy, very much following the, the steps of Joe Pine and building a very exuberant uh, experience. But th the fact is, I was talking to my fiance the other day about this experience and she's probably sick of hearing about this story because I talk so much about it. And I realized that although we both went to the same place at the same time, sat at the same table, we remembered the experience in different ways. There were some details that I remembered that she remembered something completely differently. And that, that's what's really interesting and kind of sparked the, the idea for, for, for this topic and got me researching. Because if we both went through the same experience, how would we have different recollection? Why would we remember different facts? And that, that, that's why, uh, that's how I landed on that thing. Actually, what we remember is what matters the most. And perhaps to, to understand or to deep dive a bit, from your point of view, why do you remember something different from, from your wife? And be, uh, sorry, from your fiance, <laughs> sorry, Rob. <laughs> it's a bit too early to discuss about that. I won't ask any questions. <laughs> Don't worry, no pressure uh, at all. Uh, why are you remembering in a, in a different way? It's based on your past experiences, perhaps also thinking about uh, Qualtrics. They have a specific um, exp human experience life cycle that are sharing, and it's really link to what you are explaining exactly so it's that that's the thing is every perception every memory is unique and what we remember or not for something is going to depend on our own backgrounds our likes dislikes what we've done in the past what hasn't so for example uh, one thing that drives a lot of um a lot of experience a lot of impact is familiarity right is something that feels familiar we're going to resonate so if I think back on this experience, we walked into a traditional Italian restaurant on the surface, like traditional family owned Italian restaurants. Now, growing up in Geneva, there were a lot of those. Being of Italian origin, I always had that resonance, right? That's something that always mattered to me because it's part of who I am. So that, that's something that resonated with me. She is British, full British, and her family has been in, in the region for 400 plus years. So she doesn't have that connection, that emotional connection to that aspect of the family owned Italian restaurants. So that's something that resonated with me and made the experience more special to me than it did to her. So it's really, each one of us has our predisposition, I'd say to remember something in a way or another, but businesses can still, if they understand how the brain works, how memories work, they can still try to design to make it more likely to be remembered. But there is no one size fits all, like many, many things around customer experience. That, that's just not how it works. No, sure. I fully agree with you. And uh, as we are discussing about customer experience, the one fits all is not working. You cannot offer one, let's say, customer journey or one customer experience that will fit to everybody. Because as you are saying, we had. We have different memories, we have different perceptions, we have different behaviors, and therefore we understand also, uh, also experiences differently. Uh, perhaps also to try to really understand a bit uh, what, what you are saying. How do you define memories? Because you mentioned already several times that the topic memories. So, you know, I never expected anyone to ask me how I define memories, because it's a concept that is so intuitive for most of us, right? I think is, I'd say, if you think back about anything that has already happened, what, what comes to mind is your memory, right? It, it, that, that, that's essentially what it is, is how do you recall, how do you remember, how do you think of things that happened in the past and what comes to mind? That's probably how I define memories, I think. Uh I am, I am asking these questions and these are not pre-aligned, but I would like really to understand and, and also perhaps to, to challenge you, but also to make that, that understandable to, to the others. And I said, as I said, I really love your chapter. And basically what you are saying, it's exactly what we remember. And my, my next questions is, is, do you think, or from a psychological point of view, 
it's easier to remember good experiences, bad experiences. Why, why, I'm this, why I'm asking these questions? Because there are quite a lot of statistics saying that people are sharing through social media bad experiences and, uh, and um, not really the good one. I am doing so a bit of research and I, if I directly ask to somebody, could you share, share with me please a good, uh, an experience that you, that you had, it's most of the time it's a positive experience. Yeah, and I think that that's interesting, isn't it? Because you're right. People tend to go out of their own way to share the negative experiences, but not the positives. And why is that? The, the, the positive experience, more often than not, unless it's a wow element, like, like, like the story I shared on the, from the cabaret, a good experience is simply things went according to plan, right? I wanted something, it happened, happy days. However, a bad experience, you have that disconfirmation, right? You had an expectation and that expectation has been disconfirmed, has been broken because things went wrong. So by its very nature, a bad experience is going to stand out because the reality is the majority of the experiences you have are from average to good enough to excellent. But that doesn't thing is contrast, right? The bad experience is going to stand out because you have the contrast and because us human beings, we hate loss, right? We have a loss aversion that is much, much higher than our appetites to gain. So if you combine the fact that it's going to stand out in terms of contrast, but also it's going to be more painful, that's why you have the thing is something that's negative, negative experience is going to be a much more salient, much more memorable than a positive one. However, as you mentioned, if you ask someone about an experience, a recent experience, they're more likely to, to bring the positive one. Why? Because they're going to relieve the positive one, but also because there are a lot more positive experiences available in the memory for them to rely upon. And uh, following what, what you are saying, and we are, even if not pre-discussed, we are agreeing on, on all what we are discussing. It's, I think that the, the, the biggest topic, the biggest point here, it's people remember bad experiences and good experiencing experiences nothing in between and therefore average experiences are not so funny not so interesting and therefore something can go well or can go wrong and as you are mentioning that and coming back to what you mentioned you mentioned the, the experience economy of J J uh, pine and gilmore and uh, and i think this is the key in the case that you shared with us with, with the restaurants and it was like a theater scene, they prepared everything and this helped to create memories. What, what's your view on that? It's always important to create this scene around or what, what's your view on that? I think it's, it's one of those things, right? Is we need to remember that businesses are, are in it to make money. Right, we need to be a bit cynical and businesses exist first and foremost to make money and they do that by serving customers well. So I would never advocate anyone to try to make every single experience memorable because from a financial perspective, it's just, it's just not going to be profitable, right? But th that's what I like the, the concept of signature experience or branded experience. You now businesses that really try to design specific journeys, experiences that really stand out and they are the epitome of, of that brand. And I think that that's where it really, really stands out. I think that companies need to prioritize like everything, right? They need to prioritize the experiences and what experiences they should make memorable. Because for example, if I think of when I booked to go to, to that uh, restaurant, I don't remember if I booked by phone or by, by email or website. I don't even remember how I paid. Why? Because those are purely transactional. They're not the, the most important part of the experience. So it's really important for businesses to, yes, design for memorability, but be smart about it. Really focus on what are the, the pivotal points, what are going to be the peak of the experience. I think you, you are naming them pivotal, pivotal moments. Uh, others are, are naming them moment of truth. And, and this, is, this is extremely, extremely important to focus on them. And as, as you are saying, we are in the business, we have budgets, we need to ensure that we spend, but we get also money and therefore focus on, on this moment of truth. 
perhaps also thinking about this moment of truth, what's your view on this wow moments? And there are so two different theories. One is saying, ah, oh, you need to, to create a wow moments in order to get the customer back. They will buy more, improve the share of wallet. And others that are saying um, moments, uh, sorry, wow moments are really important, but please ensure to fix the basics. The experience needs to be smooth. If you fix the basics and you, let's say, comply or uh, fulfill the needs of the customer, then you can create something that it's a wow moment. Uh, I'm, I'm going to agree with the second group uh, because essentially I, I always say, um, I always use the analogy of a parcel delivery because I used to be in that field, right? And I say, it's brilliant to have a very beautiful website that does everything you want. But if the courier actually drops the parcel and throws it on your roof, then it doesn't matter how brilliant the website is, your parcel is still on the roof. It's still messed up the, the delivery. So if I think back, I always think back in, um, in terms of um, hygiene factors. So if you think in the HR theory, you have hygiene factors and motivators. Hygiene factors is the bare minimum, right? Is the, the fact that if something doesn't happen, it's going to dissatisfy you. If it does, well, congratulations, you, you've done your job. Without those, you're never going to well someone. You need that first, and then you can drive satisfaction and well. Now, the thing that's really important to keep in mind about wow moments is what is what makes something wow? It's delight. What is delight? It's exceeding expectations, right? So the customer goes in thinking one thing, and somehow you go one level up, right? You go up, you over deliver. That's essentially what it is. Now, if you think about it, it's very dangerous to do because once you over deliver you take the risk of setting a new expectation, right? The customer knows you're able to do that. So they think, well, that's what I want next time. What if you have to wow again, you're going to raise the bar even further. And that becomes a bit of a, of a cycle where, yes, you can probably increase share of wallet. You can probably increase word of mouth and other positive behaviors. But the question is, is the value generated higher than the cost that you committed to, to try that wow? And the further you go in that cycle, the, the less profitable it becomes. Yes, and the big question is that if it's uh, long lasting, it's create value in the long term, in the long run, because exactly as you were saying, if I want to wow you, let's make the, the easiest example to make that understandable. Uh, you buy something, as you said, you, you get it, uh, you get it at home, and you have then for the next thing that you want to buy, let's say five five percent discount. But then it's my new expectation if I buy something in your company to get 5%. And if you want to wow me, then give me 10%. And therefore, it's not the way to have long lasting solutions. And there, there are some, some people discussing and sharing. If you want to do that, wow one customer, but then make quite a lot of noise around that, sharing that through social media and so on, because you, you did once. People know that, get aware of your brand and that you are you are creating these wow moments, but don't set the expectation to always over deliver because it's it's extremely difficult. And, and going back to, to what you said, and I think this is also extremely important. Sorry, if we are not really focused on, on your chapter, but I, I really enjoyed the discussion. <laughs> um, what you said is exactly, I buy something and then uh, the delivery company need to deliver that. And if it's not delivered properly, then the experience is, is not a good experience. And I think also there, what's your view on this, the difference between an experience defined by a company? This is only one piece, as you said, the payment or, uh, or let's say the, the booking of the, of the table it compared to the customer experience. The customer experience for you in your case was, uh, I go out from home, I go to the restaurant, I, I eat, I get everything what, what I need, and then I get back home. For the restaurant was only one piece of the experience. How is it possible for companies in future to cope with this end over of experiences in order to create these memories? And I think you're hitting a very strong point, right? And I would say that if you're looking from the perspective of the company, you're looking in terms of processes, right? You're looking at processes, steps by steps, et cetera, et cetera. The, the experience of the customer doesn't, my experience with, with that cabaret didn't start when I walked through the door. 
right? It started much earlier. It started when I decided to book or before that, right? It started when I was looking for something for, for us to go treat in London, then decided to book. But then my travel from my hotel to the venue is also part of my experience. Now, I was lucky enough that my hotel was literally on the same street, which reduced the opportunities of it going wrong. But ultimately, if I had to take, let's say the tube, so I had to take the London on the ground and I was surrounded by drunk people at 7 p.m. at night. So people that started partying very early on. If I was surrounded by drunk people and they were harassing us, that would have made a terrible experience for me. And chances are, I probably would remember that more than the highlights of the, the cabaret. So that, that, that's a piece I wrote years ago saying that very, very few brands in the world are going to be able to own the end-to-end -end experience of their customer. They are at the mercy of other partners that need to collaborate to make life as easy as possible. But anyone thinking they can own the experience of their customer end-to-end -end are in for a very, very bad surprise sooner or later. And what you are saying is exactly also one that one of the experience that uh, I had. Uh, I was in New York, and we asked for a specific restaurant. We did. We were not able to find it, and then we asked uh, for a cab to go there, and we showed the address, and it was 100 meter far far away. But the, the the guy driving the car didn't told us that it was 100 meter far away. And therefore, he drove us to there, there, and it was a two minutes <laughs> travel. And we asked, why did he tell you that it was 100 meters far away? And it's something I remember. <laughs> I have a memory about that, and not perhaps about what we ate there and how it was the restaurant, because it was the, the end to end experience. Perhaps you mentioned that, uh, that there are not so many companies or few companies that own the complete experience. Do you have an example, or do you, can, can you share an example? That's going to be a very awkward silence, Gregorio, because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I think like the, the one example that, that came to mind would be like, if you think streaming, right? Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, you could think they own the entire experience, but no, because they're dependent on my broadband working. My broadband goes bad, I cannot access them. If my 4G goes bad, I cannot access them. So I don't have any brand that comes to mind where they own the entire end-to-end -end experience. And I, I that, that's going to be a challenge that's going to, to bug me and I'll definitely let you know if I find one because I'll definitely try to find a solution to that. But I don't think there is any that would really be completely immune of external uh, interferences. You probably have different degrees. It's probably a spectrum from less to more involvement, but I don't think any company will live in autarky. And to, to come out elegantly from this uh, discussion, when you will find the example, then you're already invited to the next <laughs> goal, goalkeeper podcast to discuss that. It was planned to ask the question that you were not able to, to answer in order to get you back on my little show. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you, Gregorio. <laughs> Uh, jo joke by, by side, I think if we are speaking about this end-to-end -end experience, what, what is coming to my mind is about all these ecosystems that are creating, that companies are collaborating together in order really to fix that. But I also don't have a, an example end-to-end -end because also, as you said, there are different customer needs. And based on the customer needs, then experience can start. and then memories can, can be created. And also coming back to, to your chapter, what I really think in, it's, it's, it's interesting or fascinating. You, uh, you um, shared with us also the forgetting curve, the pick and rule, but, and there are so these uh, memorable, var uh, memorable variables. Could you please explain a bit what, what is exactly? So, sorry, I think that there was a bit of a delay and uh, and I lost your question. Uh, going to to the last piece of uh, of your uh, of your chapter, there are also you are sharing this uh, forgetting curve, the um, peak end rule, and then you are sharing about uh, these memories variables. What's what's? Could you please elaborate a bit on that? Yeah. So the memorable variables are, and I'm going to to be completely transparent. I completely ripped it off from uh, from this book. 
impossible to ignore from Carmen Simon that kind of gave me all my perspective on, on um, memory. Essentially, what Dr. Simon said is those 15 levers, I don't remember how she, she calls them, but those 15 levers are what are going to impact the ability to make an experience memorable. And it's a combination of those. The more we can engineer those into the, the communication, into the experience, the more likely we are to remember the information, the experience, and act upon it. And what's really interesting is that you have things that would be in contrast to each other, right? You'd have contrast and familiarity. You'd have familiarity and novelty, right? Those things are at odds. You cannot have something that is new and familiar at the same time, right? You cannot have something that's familiar and different. So it's really interesting because instead of saying, look, there's one, one way to, to go about it, you have 15 elements and you just need to find a way of combine as many of them as you can to make the experience memorable. And th th that's uh, one thing. That's probably one of the best books I've ever read in terms of uh, in terms of shaping my professional life. And like many things, is not even a customer experience book. It's always those books that come from different sources, different angles that are most insightful. But I think this is also the interesting uh, about customer experience that you can pick from other disciplines, sciences, the best out of them and then recreate and reusing that, re-leveraging that in, in, in customer experience. And perhaps my, my last question on this, uh, on the second part of, of our podcast is what is the best memory that you have about your experience writing uh, the customer experience three book? That's going to be the most boring and annoying answer I can give you, Gregorio, but I don't remember much from it. And the main reason is because, as you know, I write so much content. I'm always writing stuff. It's, it's just fades into normality. You know, it's just routine. Now, however, the best thing is when I did receive the books and I could actually touch it and really see it tangibly because I've written a lot of stuff and all of the stuff was mostly online or I could print from the printer. But having an actual book, that was such a, a pinch me moment. It was unbelievable. But it wasn't about the writings. It was about kind of seeing it materialize in front of me, I guess. It's not boring. It's a reality. If you can touch it, feel it, it's, uh, it's easier to remember that than something that you are writing, perhaps long nights because you were writing, you were editing, re-editing and, and so on. And therefore, it's, it's fully understandable. Now the podcast is going to the last part of the discussion, and this is uh, what I really like and really enjoy. It's we want to learn more about you, Gustavo. And the first question I would like to to ask it's uh, uh, as you said, you are writing a lot of articles, you are a coach, you are creating content. Uh, how can you ensure to have a satisfactory life work balance? That's the thing. I don't believe in work life balance. I believe in uh, work-life harmony, right? So it's about having the two of them fitting together. Balance implies that you need to put as much time on work as you do on personal life. And that those are completely different. And I disagree because as you said, right, I, do, I don't just have a day job, but I have other activities I do on the side. And the way I look at it is every time I'm writing content, whether it's uh, for my LinkedIn, or that is commissioned by another company, every time I'm writing content, I am improving my professional prospects, but I'm also improving my, my personal life, right? Because I'm, I'm not helping my life right now, but I'm helping Gustavo in 40 years time when he wants to retire. So I, I, I focus more on work-life harmony. I think that it's important to make sure you need, you give enough space to every part of your life, but I don't believe, it, if we were to put it into a Venn diagram, there probably would be a lot of overlap between work and life in the way I see it. And I think that that's exactly extremely important to work on something that you are passionate at, that you are interested in, because then it's 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 more harmonic together with your life in compared to so if you are doing a job that you are not happy with. You already mentioned two exactly. books in in our discussion. One book is Customer Experience 3. The second one is what, the book that helps you speaking or explaining the uh, memorable vari variables. 
is there an older book that you would like to share with the audience that you, you are saying, this is a book that I really like, I really enjoyed, or helped me during my career? Um, I think that the one book that really stood, uh, stands out to me is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Uh, when it came out, I think it was 2019, it was by far the, the best book uh, of, of that year. And I loved it because it kind of took the power of habits from Charles Duhigg and put it on steroids, really helped to understand it in a more granular, more detailed, more almost mechanical level and helped me to really understand a different way of approaching things. And one thing that really, really resonated with me is that idea of we don't try to act around confirming or working towards a goal. Right, our actions are there to confirm an identity that we have. So if I say that I am someone who exercises, I'm going to get out of my way to exercise because I have that self-image and the brain hates to have to prove itself wrong. So I think that it was, when it came out, it was a really strong book that had a lot of impact on me and helped me drive quite a few changes that ultimately culminated in, among other things, in uh, contributing to Customer Experience 3. So that's definitely a very strong one on my list. Thank you, Gustavo. And uh, the second last question is the, the usual question. If somebody would like to contact you, what's the best way to contact you? And for sure, I will share all the links in the, in the show notes. I think that the best way is by far my LinkedIn. I spend a lot more time than any normal human being should spend on LinkedIn. So I'm always connected. If anyone wants to follow, connect, share ideas, it's probably the, the best path to go and is the only social media I'm actually active on. So find me on LinkedIn is the best path. Thank you. And uh, this is my very last question. Is Gustavo's golden nugget, it's something we discussed or something new that you would like to share with the audience, to leave to the audience? So my golden nugget would be there is at least one industry that is completely free of external interferences. And I believe that this would be utilities. So water companies depend only on themselves and the infrastructure for the government, but a lot of them are government run to deliver their services. So they are companies that are completely free of external interferences in designing their experiences. They're just not the most exciting industries there is. Thank you very much, Gustavo. And as usual, I am not commenting your golden nugget because it's your nugget. Uh, the last thing that I want to say is thank you very much, Gustavo, for your time. Thank you, Gregory. It's been my pleasure. It was really a, a big pleasure and I hope that the audience enjoyed as much as I enjoyed this discussion. It was really a nice, interesting discussion with an outstanding guest like Gustavo. I can say thank you very much. Bye bye. Grazie mille. Arrivederci. Adieu.